Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's talk by David Marquand on his recently published book, Mammon's Kingdom, and the discussion following. My name is Barbara Ridpath. I am the new director of St. Paul's Institute, and this is my first ever event at the Institute, and certainly my first since I took on the position. So this is a particularly exciting evening for me. In Mr. Marquand's book, he speaks of a norm critical to democracy, and that is dialogue through which minds change and are changed, new opinions and new possibilities emerge, and the terms of political competition shift. St. Paul's Institute is a wonderful place to try and bring back such dialogue to the public square. Indeed, it is part of our mission and why we are so delighted to welcome all of you here this evening. I have only one job, which is to introduce the moderator, but I have two things I'd like to do before that. One is to ask anyone who would like to speak to me about what we're doing at the Institute to please give me ideas as we're beginning to put together a plan for what comes next. So whether you've participated before or not, please let me know your thoughts. And the second is to warn you that while we don't often have fires in this building, if the alarm goes off, you need to go out that way in a speedy fashion. Um, now, I would like to introduce Bishop Peter Selby. You will find his biography in this evening's program, but most significant, at least from my very personal perspective, is that Bishop Peter has been involved with St. Paul's Institute since 2011, beginning with his contribution to the Institute's Value and Values Report. Most recently, he has been an integral part of the interim directing team in the period preceding my appointment, for which I am enormously grateful. He has been invaluable to the Institute in defining its mission, helping the Institute think about hard topics and the theological underpinning to them, and as you can see, from, if you look at our website, by being a generous contributor to our content. Bishop Peter has had a long and august career of living his values with the courage to write, speak, and publish on issues important to him and the larger community. He is the author of Grace and Mortgage, the language of faith and the debt of the world, written, I might add, prior to the financial crisis. His forthcoming book, An Idol on Mask, which will be published in August, will be the subject of several events at the Cathedral's Institute and Forum, so I recommend you look out for details for those on our website. It is with great pleasure that I put you in the very capable hands of Bishop Peter to introduce the author and panelists and to moderate this evening's discussion. Well, I add my welcome uh, uh, to Barbara's, um, except that I will also add uh, uh, that it's an, an incredible delight to us to welcome her as the director of the Institute. Um, not just a delight, actually, I think a word, the word might be relief, um, because um, we're really glad that it's now possible that we have uh, someone to direct our, our work and I've no doubt that all sorts of interesting things are going to happen. It's been an enormous intellectual stimulus to me to be involved with the Institute, and I'm really honored to be asked to uh, chair this evening's uh, proceedings. We're, we're incredibly fortunate and honored to have with us David Markland, whose book is going to be the main subject of his presentation, and I hope of our discussion and there are going to be copies of it available afterwards uh, for you to purchase if you would like and I think you might persuade him to sign uh, a, co a copy if you would want that too. Um, it's our experience of course that it's good to have a keynote speaker but it's also good if there's if the discussion is uh, enabled, catalyzed by some speakers who follow immediately afterwards. And uh, so we've, uh, we're very lucky to have with us, in the order in which they will speak, uh, Ryan Bourne here, who is from the Institute of Economic Affairs. And um, he will speak immediately after uh, David has done his presentation. And we'll be followed by Professor Tina Beattie from Roehampton University, 
and again uh, she will give a, a 10 minute response and uh, by that time uh, we're very hopeful that Will Hutton may be with us uh, as our fourth speaker. Um, so I think without any more ado, um, I want to get us straight into uh, Mammon and all its works. And it's with great pleasure that I bring uh, to the podium uh, David Markand. His history is a history of variety, practice, academic work, advice, and I think we couldn't have had anybody um, more appropriate to precipitate a discussion uh, on uh, such a key topic as the place of mammon in our society and world. Ladies and gentlemen, David Markham. Thank you very much for those undeserved words, but I always think that undeserved praise is even nicer than deserved praise. Um, it is an extraordinary place, isn't it? Um, amazing to be in this uh, setting, absolutely amazing. Uh, and in a way it's appropriate because in the book, there, ooh, I better get them, can you pass me the book actually, I shall need it. <laughs> in case I forget what's in it. Uh, yeah, uh, in the book, uh, there is quite a lot about uh, religious traditions and faith communities. Uh, the best review it's had was by Rowan Williams, uh, who says, and I regard this as an enormous compliment, that I had done some of the necessary reflection on religious doctrine that so many commentators find too taxing. Now, is that really true? Rowan is a wonderful man. I revere him deeply, not least, because he was born in the Swansea Valley in a mining village next door to the village where my mother was born. Uh, so I feel a special kinship uh, with him. Let me start in a rather strange way. What, by telling you what I'm not what I'm not trying to do in this book. It is not a manifesto. It is not a program for government. It's intended, in, in a phrase that some reviewers have found a bit over the top, it's intended to be a wake-up call to a nation sleepwalking towards a seedy barbarism. It's not putting forward a set of policies, except illustratively. It's calling for a no-holds-barred national conversation drawing on what I call the buried riches of our culture, religious as well as philosophical and political. I think the conversation should involve all the main traditions of our political culture, conservative, liberal, and socialist or social democratic. The aim is to hammer out, through dialogue, a new public philosophy to replace the now bankrupt philosophy of the long boom of the late 90s and noughties. Now, critics, especially critics from what I would call the conventional left, object to this. Uh, they are, I think, captives to the old, top-down, laborist view of politics. What you do is you put forward a manifesto, you win power on the basis of the manifesto, you then drive the items that were in your manifesto through parliament, and bingo, Bob's your uncle. It's the chocolate bar view of politics. You put your penny in the slot, you pull the right lever, and the bar of implementation comes out at the bottom. The model, I think, is based on one of the great governments of the last hundred years, the, the Attlee government of 1945 to 51. 
but it misunderstands that history. The changes that were carried through by that government followed a century-long national conversation about what Thomas Carlyle called the condition of England question. The public philosophy that made possible Labour's election victory and provided the basis for the government's program owed as much to liberals like Keynes and Beveridge, who themselves built on the legacies of the so-called new liberals of the turn of the century, and to maverick conservatives like Harold Macmillan, among many others, as well as to self-proclaimed socialist. A radically different conversation was started by Friedrich Hayek in the explosive, terrifying, but brilliant book, The Road to Serfdom, which was published in the closing years of the Second World War. And that national conversation helped to engender the public philosophy that made the Thatcher Revolution possible 40 years later. The truth is that lasting changes cannot be forced down society's throat by the central state. A revolution of sentiment as I call it in the book, has to precede a revolution of policy. Right, why did I write the book? What, what led me to want to write it? Well, its origins lay in my utter, almost uncomprehending astonishment at the response to the crisis of 2007 to 8. This was the most, the second most devastating history, a crisis in the long history of capitalism, surpassed only by the crisis of 1929 to the early 30s. But the crisis of the 30s led political leaders in the United States, in Germany, and even to some degree in the United Kingdom, to jettison the economic orthodoxy of what was then the recent past and to embrace new approaches. Of course, the new approaches were not all benign. Uh, one of them was the Nazi revolution in Germany, but it was certainly a new approach. Nothing comparable has happened this time. No modern day Roosevelt has called on his countrymen to drive the money changes from the temple, to quote Roosevelt's wonderful first inaugural as president. No 21st century Lloyd George has called for a British New Deal. On right and left alike, the hunt is on for a somewhat cleaned up version of business as usual and a return to the pre-crash march, to the illusory sunlit uplands of ever-rising material living standards. And despite talk of tough times and hard choices, the institutions, the culture, and the assumptions that procured the crash are still riding high. Examples include the increasingly frenetic house price bubble in London and Southeast England, sharply rising household debt, an unsuccessful revolt, unsuccessful revolt by Barclays shareholders against excessive bonuses agreed by the directors, and according to the New York International Edition of the New York Times, the fact that Barclays and HSBC have been sued for rigging the price of gold. A few days later, the Sunday Times Rich List revealed that there are now 104 billionaires 
in the United Kingdom that there are more and that the total worth of these billionaires is 301, 1.33, uh, 0.133, sorry, billion pounds. There are more billionaires, apparently, living in London than in any other city in the world. The Hinduja brothers, who headed the list, were worth a total of 11.9 billion, compared to 10.6 billion the previous year. The uh, Queen, uh, you'll perhaps be sad to hear, or perhaps happy, uh, only has 330 million pounds to her name, and she ranked 28th on the rich list. On a deeper level, the remorseless growth of inequality and the social ills that are associated with it, the humiliating isolation of those at the bottom of the economic pile, the callous indifference of those at the top, the penetration of state institutions by corporate power, the decline of public trust, and the steady attrition of the public realm. All of these stigmata of pre-crisis Britain loom as large as they did before 2008. The level of public trust, essential, essential to the proper functioning of markets and indeed to democracy itself, has fallen precipitately over the last 50 years. It's now lower in Britain than in the Netherlands, the Scandinavian countries, Austria, Germany, Canada, Australia, Ireland, and Spain even, among others. According to Robert Skidelsky, one of my, one of my gurus is Will Hutton, who's, I'm glad to see him, uh, Robert Skidelsky is the other. According to Robert Skidelsky, real wages are lower than they were before the crash. Asset prices are higher. A new report by the High Pay Commission shows that the UK's poorest fifth are the poorest in Western Europe. The poorest households in the UK are closer to the poorest in the former communist bloc than to those in Western Europe. But, 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 it is, I think, too simple to lay the blame on individual greed or selfishness. There's never been a greedless society, and I find it hard to believe that there ever will be one. Anybody who went to the old Soviet Union uh, soon discovered that greed was just as prevalent there under communism as it was in the capitalist West. And the present Russian oligarchs, not noticeable for lack of mammon worship, were of course the children of Brezhnev, even if they weren't the children of Stalin. I want to suggest, and I do suggest in the book, that the crucial factors in the UK story are, one, the colonization, as I call it, of the public realm by a market state. And two, the emergence of, what I, of a style of governing that I call charismatic populism, which has stifled open debate and disguised the role of the market state in fostering inequality. So I want to say a bit about both of these. Um, first of all, the public realm. To me, the public realm is far more than the realm of governments, political parties, elections, and political debate, though, of course, they certainly belong to it. It is, in my view, the realm of service, equity, professional and public duty, as opposed both to the market realm of buying and selling and the private realm of love family and friendship. It should not be confused with the public sector. 
It's not a sector at all. It's a dimension of social life cutting across sectoral boundaries. It is a space protected from the adjacent market and private realms where strangers encounter each other as equal partners in the common life of the society. It is, I believe, rooted in the instinctive conviction hauntingly expressed in the lines of possibly the most famous dean of St. Paul's there's ever been, John Donne, in, in his wonderful phrase, no man is an island. The conviction that we are members one of another. That conviction has an unmistakably religious dimension, but in today's secular societies, I think the religious dimension matters less than the moral sentiments described by Adam Smith in the book that made him famous, which was the theory of moral sentiments, appeared quite a long time before the Wealth of Nations. He tried to show that the moral sentiments, the bonds of sympathy that kept, that, that held bound strangers to each other included far more than just private ties. Now, I, I, I try to argue that the public realm engenders and protects precious forms of human flourishing. Above all, mind and heart expanding public debate and collective action in a common cause which cannot be bought or sold or found in a narrow circle of friends and kinsfolk. Let me describe a bit how I see the history of the public realm. I'll try not to be too long. I think it grew slowly and gradually from the, ever since the revol glorious revolution of 1688 and the Bill of Rights of 1689. Equality before the law, at least in principle, was established in the 18th century. And then it enjoyed a steady, though uneven, growth in the 19th century. Gladstone and his contemporaries dismantled the ancient structure of what was called by the radicals of the early 19th century old corruption and asserted the values of equity, service and civic duty against the clinging embrace of patronage and connection. By the end of the 19th century, the patronage-ridden nepotistic state of a hundred years before have been effectively replaced by an efficient, modern state equipped with a fairly corruption-free parliament and a bureaucracy recruited and promoted on merit. Successive reform acts had widened the circle of political citizenship to embrace around 60% of the adult male population. Uh, you, you won't be surprised to know that there weren't very many adult females in it, as against 9% before the process started. Um, now, all kinds of, of bodies played a crucial part in this, the central state certainly, but even more, I think, local authorities, local governments, and churches, chapels, friendly societies, individual philanthropists, cooperatives and trade unions as well. And so was that leitmotif of uh, the 19th and early 20th centuries in this country an extraordinary growth in the number of professional occupations with corresponding qualifying bodies. That story continued well into the 20th century. By the middle of the century, 
it was generally accepted that there should be a welfare state, uh, that Hayek's critic, criticisms of, of, that, of such an idea were false and dangerous, uh, that Keynes's economic ideas should be practiced, and that there should be a mixed economy, an economy with a substantial publicly owned sector alongside a much larger private one. But, of course, that did a striking revolutionary change came about um, as a result, I think, of the cr worldwide crisis of stagflation, the unprecedented and, at the time, incomprehensible combination of economic stagnation and high inflation. Nobody knew, knew how to deal with it. Uh, if you read Dennis Healy's memoirs, a fascinating insight he gives into what, how, it, how it struck the Treasury. Um, he thought when he became Chancellor of the Exchequer, he would suggest, uh, he, would, he would be given by the officials clear policies that they thought necessary, and then he would tweak them uh, from the point of view of a practicing politician. In fact, he didn't get any policies from the Treasury. The official treasury was just as much at sea as he was. They didn't know what to do. Uh, and it's not surprising, perhaps, then, that the Thatcher Revolution took place against that background. I can't go into this in, 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 in any detail, obviously, but I think the central themes of the age of Thatcher, which covered, of course, in my view, the prime ministerships, of Major Blair and Gordon Brown, as well as hers, were defined under her government. Two themes stood out. One was moral and philosophy, philosophical, and the other was institutional and political. For Thatcher and her followers, John Dunn was wrong. Individuals were islands unto themselves. The notion that we are members one of another was a smokescreen for collectivist mollycoddling. Thatcher's alternative vision was summed up in her immortal dictum, there is no such thing as society, there are individual men and women, and there are families. That went hand in hand, however, with a relentless centralism, uh, eerily reminiscent of Thomas Hobbes the great 17th century philosopher of absolute rule. For Hobbes, only an all-powerful sovereign could overcome the self-destructive passions of human beings and make society possible. For Thatcher and her closest colleagues, only an untraveled state could cut through the clinging institutional and cultural foliage that impeded progress towards the market order of their dreams. Intermediate institutions standing between the state and the citizen, these intermediate institutions were quintessentially part of the public realm, self-governing professions, local authorities, universities, trade unions, and the BBC were suspect at best and subversive at worst. For some of Thatcher's followers, um, as I'm sure you will remember, Chairman, uh, the same was true of the Church of England, the most formidable intermediate institution of them all. Now, what we had then in the Thatcher era was a steady attrition of the public realm, driven by this view of society and how it should work. I haven't time to deal properly with all of the issues, but you can ask me questions about them if you so wish. The other point that I want to mention very briefly, though, is the, sorry, where is it here? Yes, yes, is what I call charismatic populism. Because this is what has this is what's made the whole thing possible, in my view. The great 
German sociologist and polymath, Eugene Weber, defined three kinds of authority. One was what he called traditional, one was what he called rational bureaucratic, and one was charismatic. Charismatic authority, according to him, carries all before it by virtue of the devotion and trust which the leader inspires in his followers. But it evaporates when followers no longer believe in the leader's charismatic inspiration. The fall of Thatcher is one example. She was a charismatic populist par excellence, having started in a rather de as a rather demure Finchley housewife. But when her followers somehow felt that uh, a charismatic authority was beginning to ebb, and she wasn't any longer carrying them forward on the coattails of her messianic inspiration, she was toppled ruthlessly. And the same thing happened to the second great charismatic populist leader of recent history, Tony Blair, another messianic populist, charismatic populist, when he started, uh, brought down by a rather grubby palace revolution in which the rest of the Labour Party, leave alone the general public, had no share. Now, I just want to say one more thing. I prob promise you it'll only be one more thing. Um, I uh, believe, and indeed it's the last sentence of the book, we can't go on as we are. One of the most acute critics, and a person I admire very much, uh, John Gray, the philosopher, uh, said in effect, oh yes, we can. Certainly we can. We can go on as we are. We like it the way it is. Uh, and this is what we want, and this is what we like, and this is what we're going to go on having. Well, I wonder, I wonder, and I leave you with that thought. Doesn't the rise of UKIP, something that happened long before this book was, uh, long after this book was published, doesn't that give you one or two sort of pangs of anxiety? Doesn't uh, the continuing, growing gap between wealth and wealth, the wealthy and the poor in society, doesn't that leave you with a little tweak of anxiety? Do you really think we can go on as we are? Well, I think the key question actually is how will it end the present situation? with a bang or a whimper, or maybe a mixture of the two. So that's the question that I throw to you. Well, I, I think we have a sense of the, um, the depth and the range uh, that lies behind uh, David's book and indeed behind David if I may be so bold as to say so <laughs> and I now uh, call on uh, Ryan Bourne of the Institute of Economic Affairs I want to say before he speaks not in any sense uh, so that you will make allowances because you won't need to do that but we're enormously grateful to Ryan for stepping in at the last minute uh, to take the place of his colleague who couldn't be here um, but Ryan thank you very much and we look forward to hear what you want to say in response well thank you and, and good evening it's uh, fascinating opening comments David and there's tons that we can talk about in the, the Q&A session afterwards but I'm going to stick I think to um, given that I haven't read the book I'm going to stick to um, the sort of brief that I was given by my uh, boss Philip Booth who unfortunately can't uh, can't make it this evening um, 
and, and really focus on the book and the parts of the book that we perhaps uh, disagree with. Um, so a key aspect of the book, I think, is the way it rep misrepresents the entire debate in academic economics. Um, David makes the very fair point with which we strongly agree that economics has become moribund, over-formal and over-mathematical. But he somehow conflates entirely opposed methodological approaches and misrepresents much of the economics he is criticising in order, to, I think, to try to establish the idea that there is this sort of free market intellectual zeitgeist and that more left-leaning and socially centred approaches have been ignored in the economic field. And to put it mildly, uh, we think that the story is more nuanced than that. I'm going to give a few examples. Um, David argues that the free market um, ignores the social costs of, hum of economic actions and that it treats firms as if they're just a collection of contracts, ignoring their human and institutional aspect. Yet the Nobel Prize winner Ronald Coase, one of the most famous Chicago economists for 50 years, won his Nobel Prize for two areas of work. The first was his work on how to deal with the social costs of economic activity. The second, his work in demonstrating that firms would not exist at all if they were just a collection of contracts. We're told again that free market economics um, believes that there is perfect information in markets and that this is entirely unrealistic as a model of economic behaviour. Yet the belief that there is not perfect information in markets is in fact the key starting point of analysis of the Austrian school and Hayek in particular, who David cites as the main enemy of his ideal social order. David argues that Hayek and his followers have no interest in tradition, culture and community. And yet Hayek's last book was on the importance of tradition and many of his followers, taking their cue from Eleanor Ostrom, another uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, are working in areas of community solutions to environmental problems. Perhaps the best example of this type of argument from David, however, comes when he argues that the problem is that free market economists wish to treat economics as if it was a subject like physics. Friedrich von Hayek's Nobel Prize lecture is called The Pretense of Knowledge, and in fact a great theme of The Road to Serfdom is how the treatment of economics as a formal science leads inevitably to disaster. In fact, he used the term scientism to describe precisely the phenomenon David describes. Moving on to another theme, there is common ground between us on the degree of government centralisation. But it's very difficult, in fact, for a social democrat to be consistent on this issue. And there are examples in the book where David isn't. To give one example, before the creation of the NHS, 60% of all hospitals were embedded in voluntary organisations of one type or another, and most of the rest were run by local authorities. The complete centralisation of power in relation to the health service in Whitehall is not only regarded as a good thing by David, but in fact the high point of all of the good things that have happened in the last 140 years. At the same time, David several times laments the decline of civil society institutions of welfare, yet these were in effect destroyed by that route of extreme centralisation that Bevan took when he implemented the Beveridge Report. An overarching theme towards the end of the book is the um, relationship between rent-seeking, inequality and the financial sector. Rent-seeking is, is where uh, powerful interests try to extract resources through the state. And David argues that inequality, the size of the financial centre, rent-seeking, the promotion of markets and what he calls the marketisation of the state are all somehow intrinsically interlinked. We are told that inequality leads to all sorts of social ills, rent-seeking and a breakdown of trust. But let's look at some facts. Using the measure David quotes, inequality has been falling for 25 years in the UK, whilst it is rising in other countries. David argues that as equality increases, trust increases. But the figures he quotes are reliant on a couple of outlying countries in the data, which if you remove, the relationship actually reverses. Furthermore, we know that charitable giving and voluntary activity both decrease as societies become more equal. This is true even if you exclude the US and church-related voluntary activity. Now, we can discuss data issues and how relevant these relationships are, but if data is used to justify an argument, that data should be investigated. And many of the facts in David's book 
uh, that my boss, Philip, took, I'm not going to claim for credit, took the trouble to check, could in fact be interpreted by a reasonable person in a very different way from the way that David interprets them. When we come on to the size of the financial sector, for example, which is very important for David's argument, the largest financial sectors in the world as a proportion of national income are in Australia, Ireland, the UK, the US, Switzerland, Korea, and the Netherlands. This is really the premier league of finance. The US, by the way, is fourth or fifth, not at the extreme end as uh, suggested. Unlike is as asserted, the size of the financial sector is not a driver of inequality. These countries are a mix of high, low, and medium inequality countries. When it comes to rent-seeking, David uses the work of left-leaning economist Stiglitz on this subject, again trying to emphasise the difference between relevant left-leaning economists and us obsessed free market academics. In fact, rent-seeking was developed as an idea back in the 1960s by economists in Virginia, whom David dismisses in his book in a sentence much earlier. For example, um, an economist called Stigler wasn't mentioned. Uh, another economist from Chicago, but yet he won his Nobel Prize for the development of the theory of rent-seeking. As his citation says, his studies of the forces which give rise to regulatory legislation have opened up a completely new area of economic research. One of the most well-known new books on rent-seeking is by Professor Luigi Zingales, also from Chicago. And the story behind that book is rather important. Because David argues that inequality in the size of the financial sector in the US takes that country to the extreme of inequality and the extreme of rent-seeking. He contrasts the US unfavourably with social or Christian Democrat, apparently non-rent-seeking economies. This is news to Zingales. Zingales is an Italian native. He wrote his book because he was worried about the US going the way of Christian Democrat Italy, which really is at the extreme of rent-seeking. In addition to Italy, France, Germany, Ireland, Belgium have all had party leaders, presidents and or prime ministers prosecuted or given special immunity for enriching themselves through private interests. EU top officials have been similarly culpable. In indices of government transparency, unequal Anglo-Saxon countries, including the US, and equal Northern European countries do well, but other continental European countries tend to do badly. It is not the size of the financial sector or inequality that explains rent-seeking, I'd wager. What that something else is, we can debate, but it definitely doesn't appear to be that. So we'd argue that David's main set of connections in this area are flawed. But we'd like to offer an alternative interpretation of the events, which, some, uh, which may not be particularly popular. If you go back before the First World War, the state really did very little. There's a famous quotation from A.J.P. Taylor pointing out that most people would never encounter the state unless they committed a crime. From 1870 to 1910, the state spent barely 10% of national income, and over half of that was on debt to interest. Today it spends around 50% of national income, yet we are held up as a period of market fundamentalism. Civil society, community and professional associations flourished in that era of the small state. But this was a liberal era with a small L. This is, in fact, Hayek's dream period, and it shouldn't be David's. It was from 1970, uh, 1910 to 1977 that the social democratic economy was created. The civil institutions such as friendly societies collapsed as a result. The professions were muted by state regulation of financial and related services after 1986. And friendly societies didn't disappear because of Thatcher, they in fact disappeared because of how Bevan had implemented beverage. The philosopher H.B. Acton argued that if the state took over everything that involved cultural richness, discernment, the cult cultivation of virtues, sensitive services to do with the provision of care, education and health, then the market would end up looking like a vulgar place in which nothing happened other than consumers, uh, consumer goods being exchanged. I'm afraid that insofar as David sees vulgar, uh, vulgarity in the free economy today, it is in fact the inevitable consequence of the type of post-war state he admired, which left the free economy with few functions other than the trading of conspicuous consumer goods. In a relatively small state, we could all agree on both the ends and means, and it's possible to have the disinterested political, political class that David argues. They implement what everybody is broadly agreed upon. 
In the social democratic state, however, that David would like to see, the government's decisions really do matter. Different people want different things. Bankers want bailouts. Big business fight for protection. Secularists will fight for school uh, curricula, which marginalise religion and the role of parents. Businesses fight for relevance in schools. Leftists will fight for environmentalism. Religions will fight for their religious schools and so on. If the state is responsible for the regulation of our lives and the provision of goods, services and transfer payments, it will change the character of the state. The very institutional structures that were necessary to maintain the society that David would like to see were in fact consumed by the state he wants to create. As Frederick Bastiat said in 1850, socialism, like the ancient ideas from which it springs, confuses the distinction between government and society. I'm afraid this is precisely what David does. <laughs> Let nobody say this will not be a strong debate. And I now, with great pleasure, call on Professor Tina Beattie, uh, who will respond as a theologian uh, and um, from her work in a wide range of areas. It's really good to have you with us, Tina. Thank you. The one nice thing about following an economist is that if there's one discipline that's been more thoroughly condemned and discredited in the last 10 years than my own, it's economics. Well, they keep trying to. We fight back, <laughs> as do the economists. Um, I'm not going to criticise anything of the political substance of David's book. I'm not a historian, so I don't have the historical knowledge nor indeed the economic knowledge to take it apart in any significant way and I'm just bowled over by the resonance of its analysis of where we are now, something that I think we all experience in our everyday lives, something I know I experience as an academic and which I very much appreciated David's kind of taking apart of the Brown Report and its consequences for our um, value-free in system of higher education to give but one example. So I wish I could talk for kind of five hours about lots of things I agree with, but it's boring just to say all the things I agree with. I come at this book from a rather odd background. I come at it as a post-colonial Scottish Presbyterian convert to Roman Catholicism. So I think my take on history is rather less benign than David's. I take a dimmer view of a nation that's arrived at where it is by way of a vast and, in my experience, not benign empire. And I speak as one of the imperialists, not as one of the colonized, and by way of the slave trade as well. I also worry that David doesn't analyze the extent to which the society he praises usually emerged after extreme violence. Yes, for a little while after the Second World War, Britain was in a good state, I do agree with that, but um, do we have to go there again in order to get better? And if not, what looms before us? So these are complex questions that I can't address here tonight. I'm going to focus on religion, particularly in the context of two chapter titles in David's book. One is amnesia conquers history, and the other is, who do we think we are? And David's powerful claim, which he bases in W.G. Siebold's great book, Austerlitz, about the cost of amnesia to individuals and to society, that a nation that forgets or is forced to forget its history ceases to be a nation. Now, my main argument with this book is that it is in itself guilty of a monumental act of amnesia. We can, if we like, begin with the glorious revolution of 1688 or somewhere thereabouts, and we can see a history of steady improvement until the arrival of the corruption of Thatcherism and its aftermath, and we can see equality before the law as a new thing. But what David builds such arguments on is arguably the most violent act of forceful amnesia ever inflicted upon the people of these islands, and that's the Reformation. I'm being deliberately provocative. We don't all want to be nice to each other, do we? <laughs> Standing in St. Paul's, I might as well say that. Um, 
And there is in this book a tendency, although there are occasional references to Catholic social teaching, to Aristotle, one or two, to Thomas Aquinas and Augustine, we start really after the violence of the Reformation has worked itself through the system and we start from a rather positive point in history. Even that claim, a nation that forgets or is forced to forget its history ceases to be a nation. Well, of course, we know that in September we might well cease to be a nation. And if you look at religious history, I'm not sure that we ever have been. The Church of England is not the Anglican Communion, is not the Church of Wales, is most certainly nothing like any of the forms of Christianity over which Ireland has been divided and at war, nor is it like um, the Anglican Communion overseas. So the point I want to make is that there are many, many forms of religion and we can't just say we need to listen to the religious traditions. We need to be more theologically informed and nuanced. Not all religious traditions are good. Within religious traditions, there is huge diversity. Not just which religion, but which part of which religion are we going to listen to. We talk at the moment about tolerant and radical Muslims, but the same is true of every religion, even that uh, religion that Western atheists most love to love, Buddhism. Um, every religion has its fanatics and its saints, and it's not always possible to tell the difference between them. Um, David talks very highly of Marx as the communist manifesto, which I would agree very much with that reading of it. But also, there's another great work by Marx, unfortunately named on the Jewish question, and if one can overlook its weaknesses and its prejudices of its time, it is a wonderful description of how America came to be the kind of um, society divided but also united by a wide variety of consumerist forms of Christianity, for example. Um, I would argue that societies produce religions and religions produce societies. And the new atheists have most definitely produced the religion Britain wants today. And that's the religion that was on the side of some London buses a few years ago. There's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. That's the God of Starbucks and John Lewis. Tell that to a child in Syria today. Tell that to the people of Iraq. There's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. It's the most shallow and ignorant form of atheism that's become the new form of British religion, and it's tailor-made to a consumerist society. As I was walking here, I think it was Topshop, but I passed a glossy department store which was selling cushions and wall hangings, saying, the rules of our house, love one another, eat chocolate. So there we have one of the most profound teachings of the Christian religion telling us what to do to uh, love one another. So religious historical amnesia. I want to conclude by a little example of the kind of wisdom I think we can get if we lose the ongoing, what I would say the ongoing deeply rooted anti-Catholicism that defines the English people as a people. And if you want to see the roots of UKIP and the roots of the special relationship which makes us rather look across the Atlantic than the Channel, you could go, you could do worse than look at a lingering wound left by the need to deny that childhood Catholic self of the kind of people we are. Now, I, this is not a nostalgia for medieval, nor indeed contemporary Catholicism, nor is it trying to undo the wonderful effects of the Reformation and its aftermath. The Church of England is actually ideally suited to begin to address the structure in consciousness. But until we start talking more about the pre-Reformation history, which also made us, I don't think we're going to get far with our post um, economic collapse future. So, my example then. In January of this year, the Crown Prosecution Service brought a case against three men who were caught stealing food from dustbins outside an Iceland food shop. The CPS deemed that it was in the public interest for them to be prosecuted, but the case was dropped after it generated widespread public criticism. I looked up Thomas Aquinas on thefts of this nature. Faced with the objection that it's unlawful to steal in order to remedy a need, Aquinas answers that in case of need, all things are common property, so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's property, for need has made it common. 
And he goes on to say, whatever certain people have in superabundance is due by natural law to the purpose of succoring the poor. He quotes St. Ambrose, it is the hungry man's bread that you withhold, the naked man's cloak that you store away, the money that you bury in the earth is the price of the poor man's ransom and freedom. He argues that we're entrusted with the stewardship of our possessions so that we can come to the aid of those who are in need. But in cases of urgent or extreme need, it's lawful for a person to meet their own need by means of another property, by taking it either openly or secretly. Nor is this, properly speaking, theft, because that which he takes for the support of his life becomes his own property by reason of need. Now, David Cameron caused a stir earlier this year when he suddenly came out as evangelical about his Christian faith. Blair waited till he left office before doing the same, although it involved a rather more radical step, perhaps. Um, But Cameron criticized non-believers for failing to understand that religion can help people to have a moral code. I really do not think David Cameron wants us to rediscover the religion of Thomas Aquinas with regard to theft, but I really think we should. So, (laughs) we need to roll back the frontiers of what we are willing to think. And we need to engage with a tradition that goes way before the glorious revolution, that doesn't just jump from Aristotle through to John Locke. There's a great deal in David's book about implicit and explicit about the absolute right of property and the damage it does. But we need to remember that that emerged from that huge land grab when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries and gave the property to his cronies. And when we look at how wealthy the Queen is today, we need to remember where it first came from. And if we want to undo the system, we need to go back much further than David goes in this book. This is not a criticism. It's a request, please, to write another book. We, uh, we come to our last uh, panel speaker, Will Hutton, whose um, famed statement about the state we're in, uh, I suppose, goes alongside uh, David's book, um, which is also about the state we're in now. And I look forward very much to what Will is going to bring to us in terms of his response to David's book, Will Hutton. Can you, can you hear, actually? Yeah, not good, not well. Because uh, the, 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 the acoustics are uh, uh, unpredictable. Look, I mean, I'm, first of all, delighted to be able to um, speak here. I'm, uh, I've uh, been greatly influenced intellectually over my career by David. Um, we both occupy quite a narrow kind of intellectual and political isthmus um, We're both members of the liberal left, but neither of us are socialist. Um, I uh, completely repudiate that um, tradition. Um, And what we try to do is to uh, fashion, uh, we try to answer the exam question, which actually um, a center-right economist put on the front of a book recently, uh, which is how can the mass of people flourish? How can the mass of people live a life, as Amartya Sen famously said, they have reason to value. And uh, uh, neither of us believe that the answer to that exam question has been satisfactorily provided by economic liberals, um, the tradition of the Institute of Economic Affairs, and the attempt to put into practice by Mrs. Thatcher and her followers over the last 30 years. Um, And the evidence is in front of our eyes. That doesn't mean um, that we are want to kind of invoke a socialist republic. It means we want to do something rather subtle. Um, and what's um, important about um, David's book is that um, a, he invites us to kind of um, look at our history in those terms, um, the creation of the, of the sentiment, uh, and actually the, the elites um, uh, on which actually a different architecture was constructed after the war. It was, didn't 
actually carry on answering the exam question for more than 20 or 30 years. You don't want to invent, uh, reinvent the Atlee settlement. You have to find something new um, in the next, in the years ahead. But what it's not is a continuation of what we're doing. I profoundly agree with him in that I think that the position we've arrived at is untenable. Um, uh, uh, it was broadly, and I thank you for making reference to the, the state we're in. It's actually the 20 year anniversary of the publication of the state we're in in January. And I've been writing a few chapters, rather shorter than David's book, actually, David. Um, if I get to publish in January of next year, and I've been poring over the numbers and looking at what I was saying kind of 20 years ago. And, um, you know, I was worrying about um, shareholder companies with uncommitted shareholders and the march up corporate priorities of financial, priori of financial priorities, what, what, that, what that was doing in the labor market, how that was driving new inequalities, how the public realm was kind of powerless to um, inhibit, constrain, or direct this process. And actually, the consequence was going to be um, uh, ever greater um, booms and busts, um, ever greater house price booms. Um, I didn't think, actually, that the financial system would collapse, but I was profoundly worried about what was going on in contemporary finance writing in 1994. Um, I worried whether great corporations like GEC and ICI would survive um, the takeover deal-making culture and worried whether they'd still be around, and didn't, I didn't ever believe that they would kind of eviscerate uh, as they have done. Um, I thought that it was likely that um, the structures Germany had would lead it to be a much more powerful and stronger economy in the second decade of the 21st century than Britain, but I, couldn't, I wouldn't have believed it would, that what's actually turned out, and so on and so forth. You know, everything I wrote about 20 years ago is much, much worse in 2014. Um, and there is, I think, uh, I mean, the, comp the problem of morality at the top of our companies that I noted in the early 90s has without doubt got much worse. I mean, there was no company, just to name what, no company like UK Sports Direct, uh, writing in 1994, UK Sports Direct, founded by a, a, a billionaire called Mike Ashley, worth three billion pounds, uh, employs 23,000 people. 20,000 of them are on zero-hour contracts. Um, Mr. Ashley and his executive team put to the shareholders um, the, uh, the following deal um, just a couple of months back, which actually the shareholders um, uh, turned down because it was so impossible. He wanted 4.5% of the shares in uh, UK Sports Direct to be distributed to him and his director's team. Um, the value of the shares would be worth 73 million for him alone. Um, in, and the deal was they were going to increase the profits from 480 million to around 750 million over the next three years. Now, anyone who thinks that actually sport, UK Sport Direct is going to move its workforce from zero hour contracts onto any form of employment contract where you, know, you get sickness benefit or you might you get a, a holiday entitlement or um, you might get a pension entitlement or actually you might get you know, a right actually for unfair dismissal and all the rest of it. I mean, given the fact that you're pledging yourself to that kind of profits growth in return for those kind of numbers of shares, um, is impossible. You know, the shareholders said it's far too, it's just unbelievable. We're not going to do that. And so they've come back with another deal that they're offering um, and trying to get away with. And probably that will go through in about, it's about three to three and a half cent of the equity is going to be given to the director's team. Um, this is the motion of, con of the contemporary ownerless corporation. Um, you know, gargantuan returns being made at the top and creating a kind of dynamic in our companies in which they have to displace risk onto their workforce so that you do get these numbers where you know, one-fifth of um, the UK population is actually the relatively poorest kind of in Europe, as you were saying, David. Um, I don't know where you've got your numbers on inequality. It's true that the um, top 1% um, share of... Um, of um, national income has fallen from around 14.5% in 2011 back to about 11.5%, 12% in the last couple of years. But that's largely because some of the city bonuses have actually kind of got a bit lower. 
Um, but uh, nobody expects that to hold. I mean, we expect the kind of the way that remuneration is patterned that actually as the upturn gathers uh, pace, that pattern of inequality to return. But to, 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 I, to say that in some way disproves the point that David has made, I think not really reasonable. Um, think of Thames Water, the company that was privatized in uh, 1989 for 822 million pounds. You know, its profits are now close to that 25 years later. Um, some of that, of course, will be due to the fact it was privatized. But, you know, it distrib it's distributed more than four billion pounds of dividends. It distributes more dividend, actually, than it, than it over distributes dividends to its new owners, who are a bunch of private equity investors in Luxembourg who pay no tax on the dividends that, they are di that they're over distributed and are, and are in receipt of. Um, this ownerless corporation owned actually, uh, or non-owned through a kind of, kind of layer upon layer of intermediate um, ownership structures in the Virgin Islands or wherever, um, has, needs to build a super sewer under the Thames to conduct London sewerage out to sea. It's going to cost four billion pounds. It hasn't got, because it's so over-leveraged given its current over ownership structure, designed actually to produce um, no profits and so that it doesn't have to declare any tax. It's all going abroad through the dividends. Um, it has to have a state guarantee for the, for the sewer that has to be constructed. That's Thames Water, and that's UK Sport Direct. I can take you on a Cook's tour of the entire FTSE 100, and you will find a dynamic like that in, in every one of the companies. And it's down to the fact that we, we don't think carefully about how companies are owned. We've become completely amoral about what it means to own, what kind of obligations you have to your customers, to the state, um, to the taxpayer, to your workforce, um, um, and sometimes to those immediately around you. It's not, a, not just me now, but Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, gave a lecture just some, uh, just 10 days back to, uh, on inclusive capitalism, making the point that actually you know, one of the problems in contemporary finance is actually you're not interested as a financier in actually growing the business of the um, man or woman who is your client. You're interested in actually a transaction which will reward you with a substantive bonus. And actually this amorality is actually undermining the very foundations of contemporary capitalism. He also argued for a social contract to go alongside the dynamics of, um, the, of contemporary capitalism. It wouldn't be a social contract as we built it in 1945-51. It would be a social contract that has, has to, um, I'm just finishing, that has to observe um, contemporary realities. So what the, the importance of David's book is that he reminds us how it was, this was done. Um, he invokes us to reproduce it. He understands perfectly the um, dynamic of what's taking place. And uh, it's a call to arms. It's beautifully written, and I thoroughly recommend it. Thank you. We've had a remarkable uh, variety of responses. Um, and I'm wanting, and I hope my fellow panelists will not mind, uh, I'm really wanting to give priority to you. Uh, I'm really wanting it to be possible, and I'd like to go into it straight away, uh, for us to have uh, some minutes in which uh, you address questions. Uh, to David, primarily, get yes, but to other members of the panel. And I shall be, if I may say so, fairly ruthless about how long we're allowed, you're allowed to ask a question and how long we're going to answer. Because I think it's really important that this vibrant material is, uh, is responded to. So could I begin by asking, and we've got a roving microphone, could I begin by asking for a show of hands, who, who would like to open a conversation with the conversation that David has called for in the front row on the left? I am a Scot. And I'm conscious that many people are deserting the old political parties in Scotland. They have long since thrust the Conservatives into the sidelines because they feel that nothing could be worse than the present situation. And that is evident, particularly in Labour voters in the west of Scotland, who are taking the view that they need a fresh start. 
the, the, I, I would like to point out, because we've had a Catholic uh, theologian speaking, that the Pope has recently indicated that this would be a disaster. And I'm wondering how we can act with sufficient speed to stop this disaster for the United Kingdom. Thank you. Let's take another couple of questions and then we'll get a response. Halfway down on the right. I'm looking for a, a whole new index of um, human well-being and quality of life that the politicians can trumpet. Um, other than economic growth in a world of finite resources and, um, uh, and GDP. Um, this, this was focused for me recently. There was a short article in the Times a couple of weeks ago which said that from September, GDP will include the measurement of uh, the value of, of uh, drug trafficking and prostitution, which will add 10 billion to the economy. And Thank I, you. I, and so what is... The, Adam Smith talked about the man within, which acts like the vice regent of the deity. Where does conscience come into human well-being? Thank you. Uh, one more, perhaps? Uh, can I see? Yes, there. Um, I'd like to challenge the, uh, the claim that uh, the economics is uh, the, the economic theories are actually okay uh, if you like um, and uh, particularly on some of the foundational assumptions to do with what's in the models uh, relationships are missing from the models in in a way that's more substantive than um, simple transaction uh, agents in economic models are ultimately at bottom modeled as uh, desires of consum desires of consumption and motivated by the pecuniary motive. Um, Thank so you. I, yeah. Um, I, I ought to explain before I ask David to begin the responding. I just want to explain that that Will has unfortunately had to go because his wife is extremely unwell, and um, so we're very sorry about that. Um, and uh, it's not because he wasn't keen to stay for this response, which he really was. David, do you want to respond to any of the points that have been made? Well, I'll try. Um, it, does this work now? Can you yes. hear me? Oh, that's right. Um, Robert McLennan, my dearest, dearest friend of many, many years standing, even longer than, than Will Hutton, actually. Uh, we were both elected to Parliament in 1966, and he's been a very, very close and dear friend ever since then about the breakup of Britain. Um, well, I agree, as I think you know. I think it would be, um, well, I didn't say disaster, but I think it would be a very bad thing. Uh, and by the way, it would, its repercussions uh, for the rest of the United Kingdom actually wouldn't be Great Britain. You know, Great Britain is this island, the bigger of the two islands, and uh, it includes Scotland. Um, when the, the, the Queen's uh, I official description is uh, Queen of Great Britain, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Well, she wouldn't be Queen of Great Britain anymore if Scotland seceded, because it wouldn't be a Great Britain politically. It'd be the island, but nothing was. No, I think it would be. I agree with you entirely, Bob. I think it would be um, a disaster... I also think that um, British politicians of all three main parties appear to have done their best to make sure that the Scots do vote for independence. I mean, the ridiculous, ridiculous threats that have been made. If I was a Scot, well, I wouldn't actually go and vote for independence because of these silly things, but I would certainly be tempted to. Um, no, I think, I think the, uh, the solution, I think, is a federal Britain. This is the, the logical solution. There are enormous, obvious problems. Uh, the main one, of course, being that um, of the four constituent states of a federal Britain, England is overwhelmingly 
the biggest in population, far, far, far outstripping the other three. Uh, and although there are big differences between, let's say, New York and California and Nevada, they're nothing like as great as that. And the, the differences between uh, Bavaria and, uh, and Bremen and Hamburg are nothing like as great as that. So there would be a problem. I think what one has to do really is to bite the bullet and say, well, look, this is the product of our very strange, odd, unique history that we have these four nations in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we've got to learn how to operate a federal system. If we can't, and I can't see why we shouldn't, if we can't, then breakup will happen, I believe. Well, yeah, shall I quickly? Yes. The, 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 um, uh, well, the question of where does conscience come into human well-being is a really <laughs> a big one. Um, I, I think the, to devise an index of human well-being I think would involve exactly what I'm calling for, a national conversation. Right. You couldn't sit, you couldn't get a load of economists or even a load of economists and sociologists and psychologists and God knows who, sitting in some room in Whitehall and producing an index of human well-being. That would mean anything to the general public and it, it won't work if it's not, it doesn't mean anything to the general public. So I, I I believe there has to be a very profound debate that will be part of the national conversation I'm talking about in order to devise such, a, such an index. Uh, the, then there's the question of um, the economic assumptions. Actually, you might be surprised to learn that I'm not quite as hostile to some of these assumptions as you might suppose from, from, from my uh, first discussant. Um, I think I, one of uh, my wife's and my dearest friends was a very, very great American economist, Mansa Olson. Uh, and I remember him, now he didn't actually practice this all the time, very difficult to do. He said, what we're really doing is saying, let's suppose that this and this and this, how far can we get? If we say, let's, this is as if, what we're doing all the time is as if. And when, then we look and see what conclusions follow uh, from, from those premises uh, and do they work. Now, that seems to me to be a very sensible way of doing economics, but it does involve a great deal of humility on the part of economists because they've got to be, they've got to be saying all the time, look, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about these foundational assumptions. I'm going to proceed on the basis that they may well be right, and let's see how far we get if we assume they are right. Ryan, do you want to comment yeah, on that? I'll comment on all three, actually. I mean, I'd echo David's call for um, a more federal Britain and particularly devolution of tax and spending powers. I'd go further than the, the four states. I'd devolve much more power to local authorities, too. I think we've had over centralization centralization not just from the constituent states to central government but from communities to government local government to central government government to the eu individuals to quangos who now want to decide what we eat and how we dress and all these various other things um, so i'd like to see much more decentralization of power on the um the issue of human well-being and whether we should target it rather than gdp i always find that this idea that governments seek to maximize gdp a bit of a straw man if it really wanted to maximize gdp we'd had complete open borders, we wouldn't have a planning system, uh, we'd have much lower uh, tax rates. Clearly that, that, that's not what government's trying to maximise. Um, and it just concerns me a bit, this idea that you could get, you could collectivise this idea of what is a nation's well-being and, and have some bureaucrats in Whitehall oversee how we get there. That worries me a fair bit. On the final point on models, um, models by definition are a, a simplification. I don't think any economist would say that they're an entirely accurate reflection of the real world. Where I would differ, though, is I think actually it, it, it sort of doesn't... Um, the fact that that's true, I think, argues against 
many of the social democratic institutions that we've seen build up in the UK rather than markets. And that's because I consider markets to be social institutions. I think it's what people do when they're free to do so. Um, whereas what we tend to find is when we have sort of social democratic provision of welfare, it's then, actually, rather than the sort of civil society provision, it's then where people uh, run numbers through uh, machines in DWP and the Treasury. Um, estimating how people are going to react to slight changes in marginal tax rates and things. So actually, I think you're right to an extent, but I think that's an argument against um, centralised social democratic government rather than uh, a, a sort of free market framework. Let's, uh, let's get back to the particular questions about conscience and well-being, which I think Tina might have something to say about it. I was doing a, a radio recording at the height of the economic crisis and I made some comment about the corruption of the bankers. And the producer said, oh, come on, you're being a bit hard on them. They're just doing what we'd all do if we could get away with it. To my eternal shame, I deleted the comment. And I thought about it afterwards and thought, I know I don't do that if I can get away with it because I don't do it and I do have opportunities. So do we all, even if it's just you know, um, getting away with a little bit that we don't declare on our taxes or whatever. But um, that is what we've become, a culture, not what should I do, but how much can I get away with? And we saw that with the MP scandals, we see it even with war in Iraq, not what should I do, but, you know, what does the law let me do? Um, and I think what we've lost, and government can't give it to us, it's not to do with index of happiness or GDP. Again, it's to do with retrieving an ancient tradition of wisdom that goes from Aristotle through to medieval scholasticism, the idea of virtue. The virtuous life is the happy life. It's the life where an inner conscience directs our moves, sometimes in defiance of law, sometimes in a way that ensures that laws are harmonious with the cultures and desires of people. And that also does mean the disciplining of desire. And discipline is a word we don't like. But you can't play in an orchestra if you don't have discipline. And you can't live an orchestrated life if you don't have self-discipline. And the problem is, when we lose all sight of the good as a difficult mystery to which we aspire, our desire shatters among the goods of consumerism and everything frustrates us. And of course, consumerism needs unhappy, greedy, restless people in order to keep going. So we need to rediscover that interior voice of conscience that's the voice of virtue. And the virtues are prudence, temperance, courage and justice. And if you look at the values that drive our modern economy, they are the exact opposite of that recklessness, excess, cowardice, and of course the result is injustice. I, um, I, I, we're running out of time, as I feared we might, but I just want to ask David one question. Um, I was very struck in this book by the amount of religion in it, mm. and in particular... Um, by your choice of the word mammon, which is a religious word, and your frequent use of the word worship in the book. And I wanted to ask you, is worship and mammon worship, does it, is it simply a way of talking about something you're against, or is there something you're also saying when you're using that language? Gosh. Um, gosh. Well, of course, the, 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 you may remember, I think it's the sort of epigraph to the first chapter, I quote Thomas Carlyle from one of the pamphlets that he wrote in pa Past and Present, which ends up, Verily, mammon worship is a melancholy creed. Melancholy creed, that, that's worth uh, thinking about. Mammon worship is a melancholy creed. And, um, well, I guess, uh, yes, I do talk a lot about religion in, in the book. Um, and um, that's why I was so moved by what Tina said, because, or, I mean, the fact that she said those things that moved me is part of where I'm coming from. I think the, um, one of the chapters that I felt 
most deeply about, um, or one part of the chapter, was in the last long chapter, Who Do We Think We Are? And I had a section on what I called intolerant tolerance. And I was trying to argue that there's a sort of um, rational, you know, anti-religious view being peddled by, well, notably by uh, Dawkins, but also it was by, um, oh hell, what was the man's name who died? Yeah, Hitchens. Uh, Ditchkins, as somebody called them. Um, tolerant, of course, we tolerate religion. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course we do. Um, but it has no right to insert itself into the public sphere. That attitude, I think, is something that I feel deeply hostile to uh, and needs to be combated. I try to combat it a bit, but perhaps not powerfully enough. Because I think that the biggest um, barrier to mammon worship is precisely the great historic Abrahamic religions. Now, of course, all of them have betrayed their trust. All of them have engaged in the most appalling and terrible uh, wars and, and uh, persecutions. And there was the Holy Inquisition. And there was, uh, and there is now jihadist terrorism and, and so on and so on and so on. We, we know that. That's simply to say that religious people are human beings and they don't always live up to their creed. It's not a reason for dismissing the creed, it seems to me. And I think, you see, I think that you will find within all three of the Abrahamic religions, I don't know enough to include uh, Hinduism or, or Buddhism, uh, you will find a very strong critique of mammon worship. Uh, the, ta the Muslim tradition, as I discovered, research I did for this, condemns what is called riba, which means acquiring, uh, acquiring wealth by unjust means and lending money uh, us usuriously. The Christian tradition, for a long, long time, condemned usury and was always very dubious. Of course, probably a lot of churchmen and monks engaged in it, but that's to say they were human beings. It's not to say that the basic idea is wrong. And the Jewish tradition as well contains a lot about the need to redistribute resources from the better off to the poor. So those, I think those traditions are the strongest barriers we have to the growing empire of money. Thank you very much for saying that, um, because, among other things, what you've just said is about the best summary of why there is St. Paul's Institute that, um, that you could possibly have given. Um, we are committed as an institute to going at these questions. Sometimes it means that we have to face some really difficult economic disagreements, and I think on my right, if I may put it that way, there have been you know, robust, robust conflict over some of the facts and some of the directions. But what I think we agree about as a, as a group is that these issues are very serious and they go to the very heart of the meaning of what it is to be alive. So I want, I'm, I'm sorry you had less time than you should have had to articulate your own views about what you've heard. There is an opportunity to get hold of books and in the process get hold of uh, panellists if you would like to have some informal conversation. Um, but with that, uh, and with my very, very warm thanks uh, to David, to Will in his uh, unfortunate and necessary absence, to Ryan for stepping in at the last minute, to, uh, to Tina for, um, well, what I think I must call an extremely robust defense of, uh, of the proper Catholic memory of this land. Uh, and to you all for listening and participating. Thank you very, very much, and a good evening to you all.